So. Terry, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. <laughs> So we have about six minutes. We still got a number of people still to join us, obviously.
Terry, can we just try your microphone? Is that Terry Hone Terry, you're talking sorry, about? Terry yeah. Is that Terry Hone that you're talking fine. to? Or Terry Heritage? It was Terry, yeah. No, Terry, Terry Hone. Hone. Thank you. And can you see me also? Yeah, uh, coming over loud and clear. So can we just go back to Phil? Phil, your microphone seems to be causing a pro problem. Do you just want to switch it on no. for a second? Yeah, fine. I was muted by the moderator, no. so I stayed quiet. There yeah. is a bit of noise in the background. Is my now. microphone coming across OK? Yeah, okay. Afternoon. Richard, afternoon, you're looking very smart. Very neat if you cabinet, it's public meeting. <laughs> Richard, when I was conversing with you then, there seemed to be quite an echo in the background. Does my microphone sound okay? Your microphone sounded great at this end, David. How does that sound? Okay. Yeah, that's... Okay, good. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Thank you. David as well. There is um, a slight delay from turning the microphone from unmute to, sorry, from mute to unmute, and therefore it's worth just waiting a couple of seconds to speak. That's for us. I don't okay. know about for you, but, but that was the case on Friday. Okay, thank you for that, Richard. I note that we're still waiting for Derek Ashley, but um, we will make a start when we get, well, we're at two o'clock now, so we'll make a start. Uh, and no doubt Derek will join the meeting at uh, a certain stage. So, uh, welcome to this meeting of Hertfordshire County Council. I'm David Williams, and I'm the leader of the County Council. I just want to make an announcement at the at the start of the meeting, namely that following the government announcing that the UK has now moved into the delay phase of the response to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically in accordance with the local authorities and police and crime panels, uh, uh, coronavirus flexibility of local authority and police and crime panel meetings, England and Wales regulations of 2020. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the Council's website for them to do so. 
Members of Cabinet are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch their microphones off once they finish speaking. To indicate a wish to speak, members should either raise their hand so that I can see it or request to speak using the chat function. I will ask members to vote for, against or abstain for each item at the end of the debate on that item and ask that members indicate their vote using the public chat system. I will declare the result after each vote. Officers are in attendance but will keep their cameras and microphones switched off unless called to speak. So, um, turning to the agenda of our meeting then, the first item of the agenda of the minutes, um, can we confirm the minutes of the meeting of the Cabinet held on the 23rd of March as seen as an accurate record? Agreed? So I'm getting thumbs up from everybody and I'm getting a bit of feedback on chat, so that's excellent. We will take those uh, as unanimous agreement for the minutes of our last meeting. Agenda item number two is questions from members of the council to executive members and there are none. Item number three, public petitions, there are none. Uh, we are all reminded that all equalities, implications and equality impact assessments undertaken in relation to any matter on this agenda must be rigorous, rigorously considered prior to any decision being taken. So let me move on to the first substantive item, which is, the, which is Hertfordshire County Council's response to COVID-19. Um, colleagues, you will have seen the quite extensive report that has been circulated and uh, this sums up for the benefit of members of the council and for our residents the actions that the county council has taken so far in response to uh, the pandemic emergency. At section four in the report, it summarizes the international and national position. Um, I would just highlight that at paragraph 4.1.1, um, the latest figure in terms of the accumulated, uh, cumulative number of, res of um, individuals hospitalized in Hertfordshire uh, as of yesterday was 1,808 um, individuals. And I think it is fair to note that um, whenever local authority areas are reported, Hertfordshire appears quite high up in those reports. And I think that reflects a number of things. I think it reflects obviously the size of the county with nearly 1.2 million residents. Um, we um, have a sizable population. And then, of course, our proximity to London is undoubt has undoubtedly been a factor in a number of cases locally, as indeed has the number of people who've um, inevitably travel internationally who live within our county. And for instance, at the start of this, um, of the pandemic, it was very clear, for instance, that there were people who'd been traveling to and from the Far East, and indeed people who'd been skiing in Northern Italy, um, who were coming back to the county and very quickly uh, identifying that they had, um, um, a, uh, had actually caught the, uh, the virus. So section four sets out the national and international position. Section five then uh, highlights the position in relation to Hertfordshire. And I think it is important that we all recognize that uh, much of the response to the pandemic is being um, coordinated by the so-called strategic coordination group. Uh, now, this is an element of the local resilience forum. Um, and across England and Wales, there are resilience forums essentially in each police constabulary area. And so the Hertfordshire Resilience Forum, established under the auspices of the Civil Contingencies Act, has played an important role in, co in coordinating our response. And I just go to highlight, just want to highlight that the County Council has had a significant role in this. The Chief Fire Officer, Darrell Keane, is the chairman of the Strategic Coordination Group. 
and then a number of the elements that are reported in Section 5 um, include the role of the Fire and Rescue Service, uh, they include the business and um, community update and the um, resilience work that, uh, and recovery work that we're doing uh, and contributing to under the auspices of the SCG. And then importantly, it highlights the work of the Volunteer and People Assurance Cell, where that work is being led um, by um, county council officers. And as that section of the report goes on to say, um, this is the work that's um, been known nationally as Operation Shield, i.e. to support those vulnerable people in Hertfordshire who have been instructed to self-isolate for a period of 12 weeks, largely because of the medical conditions that they are living with. Uh, but then also we highlight the work of Operation Sustain, where we are looking to support those residents of Hertfordshire who haven't been identified by the NHS, but nevertheless are vulnerable, and we have chosen um, to support them in their homes. Section 6 of the report then goes on to highlight the work done by the County Council specifically and um, the work of our service areas. I think notably I want to highlight the work that's been undertaken by our adult social care team. I have in various places referred to this as, um, as we've been um, throwing the kitchen sink at um, the requirements of um, those people who require care and support across the county. Uh, this is an area where we've been working very closely with the uh, National Health Service and have been playing a key role in freeing up capacity in our local um, acute trusts, the NHS hospitals in Hertfordshire, particularly uh, the hospital in Watford at Watford General and the Lister Hospital. And so a key part of our work has been supporting care providers with the incremental cost of operating with significant proportions of their staff away sick or potentially self-isolating. There have been significant challenges in terms of carer recruitment and training costs that we've been helping providers with. We've taken a very bold step to pay our suppliers, not just our care suppliers, but also all of our, um, uh, um, all of the people with whom we are contracting services and have payments to make. We're paying them on a cash basis rather than on the on a basis of um, 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 accounts payable. We've purchased additional care and nursing home places. Um, we've put in place arrangements to support the rapid discharge of um, residents from hospital in, also in, in order to free up beds. We've been supporting the whole question of the provision of PPE locally and meeting some of the logistics costs involved with that. And then there have been some very real requirements in terms of housing related support costs that we've um, been um, uh, funding, particularly in relation, for instance, to domestic abuse or some of the more vulnerable people uh, across Hertfordshire. So I use those as examples of one particular service area that has been pulling out all the stops in respect of our residents. The report goes on to highlight a number of individual issues being addressed by our services. There was a very real concern at the outset of the government's move to lock down the, um, uh, the country and for us to stay at home in order to protect the NHS. And we very quickly moved to close our libraries and we also uh, closed our household waste uh, recycling uh, centers. And so those two services uh, have been suspended. But I have to say that right across um, our service delivery and then in terms of how we have moved to move staff into other 
um, client and customer facing roles in order to respond to the demands of the crisis. I am just immensely proud of the work that our staff have done. And as you'll see in the report, it is, uh, there are an extensive range of initiatives that we have been required to respond to um, in order to protect our residents and respond to the crisis. Now, I know this report was circulated and was considered at the special cabinet panel um, that uh, was held on Friday, and it would be really good to get feedback from executive members, A, on initiatives that have been taken in their areas that they want to highlight, but also the key things that came out of that discussion um, on Friday. So I'd welcome any contributions from colleagues uh, on the response to the crisis so far. Can I invite Richard, then Phil, then Tim to, to contribute? Richard. Thank you, David. I think you've covered most of the areas uh, within adult social care where we have a have made a significant contribution to trying to mitigate and deal with the COVID crisis. I think as a starting point for me, I think it was the preparation by adult social care led by Ian McBeath and his team, and there are a number of individuals that could be mentioned by name, but the preparation with our healthcare colleagues uh, to effectively take people out of hospitals and find them accommodation so that there was no bed blocking and that the hospitals were ready, both at the Lister and Watford, for those patients coming in uh, was nothing short of exemplary. And that work continues to today where patients, as soon as they are uh, able to leave hospital, can do, and we have the bed capacity in place. We worked really closely with our Hertfordshire Care Providers Association, who we support financially, uh, and as a result, really good liaison with those care providers, some 300 across the county, and other care settings to make sure that they are ready uh, for the coronavirus and being able to have the capacity uh, to, to, to deal with them. You mentioned PPE, so I, I won't. I would also just like to, to thank both hospital staff and our own uh, social care staff in a number of settings. Those might be in care homes, they might be in extra care homes, they might be supporting those with learning and physical disabilities in their homes. And I just like to, because they are facing some of some of the most difficult situations they will ever have done professionally. Not only are they doing giving day-to-day -day care, uh, personalised care, uh, but they're also witnessing a number of people being very ill and then passing away. And so I pass on uh, my heartfelt thanks for all that is being done in all of those settings. Um, I'd also, uh, as an aside, um, you mentioned about the Shield and Sustain programme, about being able to support our most vulnerable. And Heart's Help have really stepped up to the plate uh, in fielding phone calls from our residents, uh, trying to understand government regulation and the potential support on hand. And as a result, uh, uh, we have something like 30 uh, people manning Heart's Help now, uh, seven days a week. Uh, and as a result, we have uh, sent out something like 7,000 food parcels, about 150 medical prescriptions. And that programme of supporting people right across the sort of vulnerability spectrum continues day in, day out. Um, I even had a, a bakery contact me with uh, offering uh, spare uh, rolls and bread and goodness knows what. And today I know that they were delivered to Mundles, then sent out to those that need them. And of course, we're also supporting food banks, our district colleagues uh, and other charities with, with food parcels so they can go out indirectly. Um, I think, uh, finally, perhaps a thank you to all those who volunteered, some 9,000 now, of whom about 2,500 have been redeployed uh, to do something really meaningful across the county. And my apologies that we haven't been able to find uh, uh, something for everybody, but I think those are the sort of people that are already contributing in their communities, and I suspect they're already contributing. So thank you, David. That's it from me for the moment, from Adult Social Care. number of colleagues who want to speak, but if I can go, can I go to Tim first, um, uh, Phil? So Tim, then Phil, then Terry Heritage, and Terry Duris, and Terry Hone. Um, but Tim, 
Yes, um, oh, we've thank got to you. Is that, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Tim, thanks. Oh, great. Yeah, um, I mean, you, you, both you and Richard have covered quite a lot of what I would have covered. Um, you're quite right. We've had over 1,800 cases, hospitalised cases in the county. Um, and that is one of the higher numbers in the in the country. But, and I think it needs to be said, is that actually if you compare it per 100,000 population, uh, we're actually somewhere below mid-table. Uh, it's about 1.4%, so, so that's good. Um, I think I'd like to pay tribute, I, I think, to a whole range of stuff, obviously in my own public health team, uh, but, but I think right across the authority. Um, we've been working on this now right from the, the contain uh, through the delay uh, phase, you know, going back into February, really. And um, I think the success of the work that's done is, is, is illustrated quite clearly by the impact or, or reduced impact that's been on the National Health Service in the county. You know, we had a great fear that we would run out of critical care beds. Uh, that hasn't happened. We've still got capacity. Uh, we're not complacent. We're still working at it. Uh, but I think it's a, a really good indicator. Uh, we still have a capacity for care beds in the county, although I, I think I have to point out that actually that's probably a little more marginal, and it's something we need to keep a very close eye on. Um, I think within relation to PPE, that's uh, been in the press on a regular basis of late. Um, all I can say on that is in the county, I think we have sufficient at the moment. Uh, and again, we're not complacent. We continue to work hard to make sure we maintain a supply. Um, and in mentioning PPE, can I particularly mention the University of Hertfordshire? Um, about two or three weeks ago, we were in a critical position in terms of hand sanitizers. Uh, they stepped up to the plate wonderfully, I think, um, and we worked with chemical suppliers and, and people in the county, got them the, 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 the equipment and the, the ingredients for making hand sanitizers, and they produced them and continue to produce them. I think that's wonderful. Uh, and, and in fact, they, they've moved on from that. They're now producing face masks as well, plastic face masks. So I think, you know, it's a big team effort going on in this county, uh, and I think we should be really proud of it. Uh, and finally, if I may, can I mention the general public? Um, you know, I think the response to the lockdown has been first class. We, we all hear uh, the press picking on uh, examples where people have breached the lockdown, but actually they're very much in a very small minority. Um, the vast majority of people have stuck to the lockdown, and as a consequence, I think we're either at or about to, 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 to breach the peak. Um, that's not to say that I think we, we need to take our foot off, off the pedal. I think we need to continue on this for, for a little while longer. Uh, but I think there are good signs, and, and it's probably one of the good signs is a notable decline in the number of people calling 111 in the last two weeks. So thank you to an awful lot of people, but also to the people of Hertfordshire. David gone. Well, then Terry Juris, Terry Heritage, and, right. and, and, uh, the police, and Terry Who is, who is next? Bill. Is it uh, Bill? Bill. 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 Bill, why don't you take it up? Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yeah. Right, fine. Thank you, David. My hat obviously goes off to the service areas directly involved with managing the crisis, but as far as highways is concerned, I would just like to thank the officers and operatives for working hard and also creatively to keep our roads safe and serviceable. Apart from emergencies, we are doing as much as we can on the highway, safely and in accordance with government guidelines, hand-picking sites that we can do that work accordingly, and this includes regular maintenance and resurfacing. Uh, grass cutting will commence soon. I think uh, people will notice that districts that are responsible for their own grass cutting have already started, but we will start our grass cutting at the beginning of next month um, and uh, take it on a gradual basis. As an example of how Ringway are being supported during the crisis, they recently responded to an urgent request by Lister Hospital via Stevenage Bar Council to provide road markings within their uh, property um, boundaries to redirect traffic around the hospital grounds in view of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. They did this, I believe, the next morning, having received that request. So I'd just like to 
pay tributes to our uh, contractors for actually supporting the wider community during this crisis. Thank you, David. Hi, I think we might have lost David. Um... a bit of a delay um but terry can uh, you sorry yeah no you're there okay good can you hear me yes i can yeah okay i'm sorry about that yeah Kristen crashed again um yes just can i say um about children's services the other part of our vulnerable um community um our children and young family and families um, I'd like to say a big thank you to the frontline workers, our social workers, our personal assistants, and other youth workers on the front line who are still out there working with our families. Um, around our children in care, just to assure you all um, that all families have been um, communicated with and are being um, monitored. And with Families First, we are making sure that they receive um, either food if necessary or all the support that they need. The, um, those children who are in care, um, a lot, our virtual school actually made sure that every single family who didn't have one had laptops and access to the internet so the children could actually um, have access to education. This is something the Secretary of State spoke about yesterday in the press briefing, and I'm pleased to say that Hertfordshire was on the front foot and did that right at the very beginning um, when children, we knew children were going to be at home. For our less learning disabled children and, and less mobile children, um, support has been taken into their home if needed, and those that use um, overnight short breaks, um, many parents have decided not to let let the children go for a short a short break at the moment, but I believe that's beginning to change. Um, so we have made sure that they have um, support at home. The spare beds that have arisen are being used for those young people who um, might have to leave home suddenly because they're not getting on with their parents. Um, or uh, preventing them having to go into hospital. So I just wanted to assure you that all of our young people um, from zero to uh, 25 are being protected. Thank you. And then um, Terry Hohen, Terry Dourous. Can you hear me? You want Terry, Terry Hearn speaking here? Okay. Um, can, I'll talk on I'm two subjects if I can. One is on what the Fire and Rescue Service are up to at the moment. The Fire and Rescue Service um, are supporting the community, uh, like many others are, and we are grateful for what, all the work they do, particularly around, in this case, drivers for ambulance services. We have now, I think, 17 drivers of, of fire and rescue trucks who are now um, driving for driving ambulances on behalf of the Ambulance Authority so that it does relieve the driver to do other things more importantly around because they're military trained. They've also been delivering uh, goodies to uh, things like medicines and such like uh, to vulnerable people as requested. So we have them there ready to go uh, when they want to. They do have some PPE, which they may well need in certain cases where they're visiting. As you can imagine, with some things we've suspended, particularly around uh, home visits, but uh, certainly the fire and rescue service are there. They are active. Yes, on a reduced staff because some sorry, our firefighters have uh, had to isolate. So, but the fire and rescue service is there. It is up and running. It is manned appropriately, and it will respond to all incidents that happen as and when. As you can imagine, the number of road traffic accidents has gone down. However, the number of fires, particularly bonfires and I might say arson has gone up. And so they responded to those appropriately. Uh, disappointing that people decide to have bonfires uh, because it's something they don't do very often, I imagine, and set fire to their own fence or their own house or their own trees. But that is something they can't wait to deliver the fifth to do, I suppose. So yes, we're responding to fires, some are so deliberate. When it comes to waste, 
I guess the big question, as the leader mentioned, was when are we going to open the Hearts All Waste Recycling Centres? Um, good question. The answer is when it's safe to do so is the very key, and we need government guidance on that to make it absolutely clear that uh, going to the tip, if I may call it that, is an essential uh, task, and the public can respond to it. We do have a plan ready to go. Um, if we are given the green light by government that says we can go, uh, we, of course, will liaise with our neighbours, because what we don't want to happen is them to open their sites and us not, and vice versa, because we get cross-border work then that could cause some angst amongst uh, uh, our residents. So we don't particularly want that. So we, when we do open, it will be a phased opening. We won't open all our sites immediately. It will ultimately be at the big sites we open first, and we'll try and do that in, in the four corners of the county. But the, we expect to have somewhat of a, um, I say, a cavalry charge towards the House of Waste Recycling Centres where we do open them up. So we've got the police involved, as the leader said, in making sure that we can manage traffic. We do have the cones. We have the the um, barriers all ready to make sure that the uh, recycling centres can keep um, some social distancing, the two metres between the vehicles and between people who are pulling in their rubbish. The big question is, do we limit the type of rubbish that can go to the Hearts Always Recycling Centres? That is a debate which is happening, and we fear that if we did do something like say, you can't bring this, you can't bring that, that could cause more confusion and perhaps more anxiety amongst the public than we really want to. So that is something which is a debate which we do on a national level. Please bear in mind that we are liaising with our peers throughout the country and we participate in some major discussions about when, when and how the House of Race Recycling Centres can open. But from our perspective, we want them to open as soon as safe to do so. It is very important that, the, that we know that during lockdown time, people are doing jobs. They are doing things. I'm doing jobs and so everybody else on the screen is as well at home. And uh, they want somewhere to get rid of some of their rubbish which they can't put in there in their uh, curbside waste. So we appreciate that. And so we are looking to open up the House of Waste Services as soon as we get a green light from government to do so. I think I'll end there, Leader. You can hear me. Um, Terry Doris, you wanted to come in? Terry Doris, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I'm trying to, but my microphone doesn't seem to want to turn on. It's okay now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Uh, really, I just wanted to uh, reflect on the the day that the announcement was made that schools had to close. And, and for a period of time immediately after that, uh, to the view of the public, I hope, um, there was a level of uh, quiet control and, and determination where behind the scenes our staff were working furiously to make sure that all the preparations were in place, all the activities were in place um, for both the benefit of the students and pupils that we have and also the, the teachers and, and all the uh, school staff. And I'd like to just place on record my appreciation for the contribution that all the school staff have uh, put in and all the officers at County Hall have put in to uh, maintain the service as best we can. And that's reflected over the Easter holiday period, if you can call it a holiday, because we had something over 60% of our schools, our primary schools, actually open and receiving children, uh, particularly the children from key workers and those who might be regarded as being vulnerable. So that was an important facility that we had. Um, going forward, uh, or at the same time, um, Hertfordshire Grid for Learning put out to schools a whole range of additional and uh, remote learning facilities that they could use. And of course, today we have the announcement and the opening of the Oak National Academy um, run by the Department for Education. And having had an initial look at it, it, it is quite remarkable what has been built in a very short period of time. And I hope that uh, all the young people who are at home will take the opportunity to engage with it because it is vital that we maintain a level of education going forward for all our students so that there is no disparity between those who have worked at home and those who are perhaps um, perhaps 
taken a slightly more relaxed position so that when the schools do reopen in the fullness of time um, there will be a, a reasonably sensible level of, of achievement for all of them so that's pretty much where we are uh, grateful thanks to everybody um, and uh, we look forward to the future and uh, the important thing is to make sure that everybody stays safe and that is the overriding consideration that we have and we are bound and governed by um, the science going forward. Thank you, David. Thank you for that. Hopefully you can uh, hear me now. I've got my microphone on. Um, so I just want to conclude this um, uh, session by thanking you for your input. It highlights just uh, how much work has been done across the county, particularly by our staff. But also I'd like to extend my appreciation to the staff of our partners across the county, particularly in the public sector. So the NHS, the police. Terry, you've just mentioned the um, uh, the schools uh, and the work that they're doing. So my appreciation goes out to what has been a fabulous effort um, across the county. So now I, I want to move the proposal to agenda item number four, namely the Cabinet Notes Hertfordshire County Council's planning and response update to COVID-19 and would um, ask you to let me have your um, votes via the chat system. So I've got responses from Terry Heritage approved, Terry Hone agreed, Phil Bibby agreed, Ralph Sangster agreed, Tim Hutchins agreed, Richard Roberts agreed. And I think that concludes that session. So thank you for your contributions to, uh, to that. We'll now move on to agenda, it agenda item number five. And I'm getting a bit of an echo again, I'm afraid. So this is Hertfordshire County Council's finance update in response to COVID-19. And I'm going, to, I'm going to ask Ralph Sankster, the um, Executive Member for Resources and Performance, to introduce this. Ralph. Thank you, David. Um, uh, this financial report uh, was to brief the special cabinet panel, which was held on Friday, and Cabinet on the financial challenges facing, uh, faced within Hertfordshire as a direct result of the coronavirus pandemic, and to seek approval for a financial package to support our communities. Uh, as well as the impact on our communities, it is clear that COVID-19 will also have, have a significant financial implications for the County Council. Uh, matters have certainly been fast moving in this uh, area, on Friday, myself and the Chief Financial Officer were highlighting to the Special Cabinet Panel the forecasted funding gap that was developing between what we were spending on COVID-19 response and the funding we have been receiving from central government. Uh, to remind Cabinet, uh, uh, up until the weekend, the following funding for local government had been announced, uh, a £1.6 billion package for direct COVID-19 pressures within local government, and a further £1.8 billion for business rates relief and grants, totaling £3.4 billion of support. However, on Saturday afternoon, the Secretary of State, Robert Jenrick, announced a further £1.6 billion of funding for local government. Uh, we await details of how this will be allocated to councils, but I'm confident that the circumstances of our financial pressures which had been clearly demonstrated to MHCLG, were instrumental in this new allocation. In support of our economy and small business sector, grants of £10,000 are in the process of being paid to those businesses which form the backbone of our economy in Hertfordshire, and to date over £50 million of grants have been distributed. Uh, further cash grants of £25,000 for companies operating in the retail, hospitality, leisure, sectors can now be applied for. The Council has also been working uh, to support those companies who supply it with goods and services, making invoice payments immediately when approved rather than on agreed terms, uh, credit terms to ensure suppliers can continue pr to provide essential services to residents both now and in the future. Uh, additional funding has also been put in place to support the widening of uh, Council tax relief 
uh, for those in financial difficulties. The report highlights five categories of financial pressures being experienced by the Council due to COVID-19. These include uh, where immediate additional expenditure is required to ensure that critical services can be maintained. Uh, an example is in making sure we, under, we underwrite additional costs of extra staffing and cover for social care providers to ensure they continue to provide services for vulnerable people. Secondly, when the knock-on effects of disruption leads to increased costs of providing services in general, for example, a foster carer needs to self-isolate and cannot support a child in care, the alternative provision is likely to be more expensive. Also, during the lockdown period, there may be greater risks of family breakdown and children uh, not, uh, not supported. Uh, when, uh, where disruption leads to reductions in, of income for, uh, for traded activity, especially where this relates to schools, for example, and school meals and music tuition. Fourthly, when the need to support our communities means that savings programs cannot be achieved in the timescales originally planned. And finally, where delays in our capital program delivery lead to increase in, uh, increased interim costs, where mitigation measures need to be put in place. Our initial forecast of the short-term costs in it were in excess of £35 million, which greatly exceeds the £26 million available to the Council uh, from the initial £1.6 billion provided nationally. On top of this £35 million, there is also a cost of £12 million to secure additional care beds to support hospital discharge. We expect the funding for this to be made available through health service grants. It should be stressed that these are the initial estimates and full costs could well be higher. Also, this only picks out the short-term impact. This is delayed savings plans and reduced income, including council tax income, to significantly affect our budget plans for the 2021-22 for financial year and beyond. Whilst there must be a focus on supporting our communities through the current pandemic, we must also work to ensure that, that other projects continue and the current savings plans must be continued to, to be delivered where possible to prevent further deterioration in the financial position. In conclusion, Chairman, given the scale of the cost pressures, both short term and into the long term, the, state, the, the statement from the Secretary of State over the weekend to provide further financial support to all councils is extremely welcome. However, it must be stressed the majority of the pressures identified to date relate to the first phase, the first phase of the COVID-19 response. If restrictions continue into the summer and beyond, financial pressures will once again mount. Uh, and the Council will continue to work with MHCLG to identify and ensure the scale of costs, cost pressures are clear and well informed. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. That's um, very helpful. Thank you. Um, colleagues, do any of you want to make any observations in respect of this um, report that's in front of us? My video has frozen, so I can't see if you are. So, Richard, you wanted to come in? Richard Roberts? Yes. Uh, Richard, can you hear me? I can hear you now, Richard. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, 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 I think I'd just like to reiterate our thanks to the Secretary of State uh, and, and without wishing uh, uh, to sound uh, uh, too creepy, uh, to thank you, David, in your role as Chairman of the CCN uh, for um, lobbying on behalf of, of all of the upper tier councils who are incurring uh, a large amount of expense in dealing with COVID, where we are literally throwing the kitchen sink at it. Uh, and that's what you and that's what uh, government expects us to do. Uh, there will be a day of reckoning, uh, and I absolutely understand what Ralph is saying. We need to account for all of this expenditure uh, because we will be held to account by both government uh, and by the public. Um, but we must. This is this is really just an opportunity to say thank you for government recognising the contribution we are making and will need to make in the in the coming months, uh, because whilst our hospitals do appear to be coping and coping reasonably well, um, uh, the, the the virus itself uh, is not going away sometime soon. So thank you.
Richard, thank you for that. If there are no other colleagues wanting to come in, I would just really conclude by saying that, yeah, I too welcome the um, uh, decision that's been made by the government in the uh, last 48 hours to provide additional funding at this time to local authorities to meet the additional costs of the um, COVID uh, pandemic. And in particular, I'd highlight the work of the Secretary of State, Robert Jenrick, in terms of securing this additional funding. Um, included within the um, pack and on the website is a copy of the letter I sent to the Chancellor and the Secretary of State on the 1st of April, um, setting out my concerns at the financial position. Um, and that was in my capacity as the Chairman of the County Council's network. I'm just very pleased that um, we have the government has responded to the very clear message that it's been given, uh, and this is uh, a really important source of funding for us um, to see us through the next few months at least. But as others have highlighted, uh, there will be further challenges and um, essentially a further reckoning that we will need to return to at some stage. So the proposal in front of us, whether there were four recommendations uh, firstly, that we note the significant finan financial implications. Uh, secondly, note the likely further implications in future years. Uh, thirdly, note the lobbying already underway. And then fourthly, approves the proposed financial package to support communities as detailed in Appendix A. Uh, if we can use the chat function just to express your uh, agreement for, against, or otherwise. So I think that is from all of you. Uh, all are agreed. So that propo that proposal is agreed. So thank you for uh, that support, and thank you for your contributions this afternoon. Uh, that item concludes our business. Thank you.